Our sermon text for today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. It's also printed in your bulletin. Luke, chapter 16. And I'll begin reading in verse 19. Luke chapter 16, and I'll begin reading in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime... You in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from here to there, from there to us, rather. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're continuing uh, in our study of the Gospel of Luke that Luke that will be in the spring and I think this morning we come to the most memorable parable ever told, not just by Jesus, but by anyone. And of course, it's memorable because it's so frightening. I well remember when this parable was read in the church I grew up in as a kid. It is a parable. That means it is a story. It's fiction. I don't think there was a historical figure named Lazarus that Jesus had in mind. Just like when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, I don't think Jesus was thinking about some family he knew back in Nazareth. And because this is a parable, we should not press the details too much. I don't think that because of this text, we can say with certainty that in people in Hades or hell, those, those two words mean the same thing in the New Testament, I don't think we can say that people in hell can see and communicate with people in heaven. We, we shouldn't read too much into the details of the story because that's not how you use a parable. But a parable is told to teach truth. And Jesus is not just here trying to tell a scary campfire story. He means to teach us about a very real place called hell. Uh, Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. And that means if you don't take hell seriously, then you don't take Jesus seriously. And Jesus was beyond dispute, I think, the most influential person who ever lived on planet earth. If if you're going to take Jesus seriously, you've got to take hell seriously. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I want to show you three things about hell. First of all, the road to hell. Then second, life, and I've got scare quotes around life in hell. And then third, avoiding hell. All right, first, the road to hell. The main character in this parable is a rich man. And in just a very few words, Jesus deftly describes how wealthy he is. He eats the best food every day and lots of it. No expense is spared for this man's daily food. He has a gate at the front of his house. Now, I know some neighborhoods in our community have gates in front of the neighborhoods, but those are ornamental. I think they all are anyway. This gate isn't ornamental. It has a function. There's security manning this gate in front of his house. He has guards guarding his wealth. He wore the best clothing 
Purple dye was the most expensive dye in the world. Only, the very, only kings could afford it. And he even wore the best underwear. Fine linen was the garment you'd wear closest to your body. So he's, he's a rich man. Now we are warned time and again in scriptures, in the scriptures about money. In 1 Timothy we read that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In Matthew 13, Jesus teaches about the deceitfulness of riches. And in Mark chapter 10, after the rich young ruler walks away from Jesus, Jesus says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now we in this room need to hear that because if you're in this room, I think I can say this without fear of contradiction. If you're in this room, you are wealthier than 95% of the people in the world. We are in the top 5%. And some of us in this room, I wouldn't be surprised if some families in this room are in the top 1% of the United States. We are wealthy. But the problem with the rich man is not that he's wealthy per se. Because the Bible is full of righteous people who are also well off. You've got Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Lot and Job and David and Solomon in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you have followers of Jesus like Joseph of Arimathea and Lydia and Zacchaeus. So the problem with a rich man is not simply that he has a lot of money. The problem with a rich man is that he's nothing but a rich man. His wealth is his identity. Now, what do you mean when you say of somebody that such and such is their identity? It means that this thing is how you know who you are, why you matter, why you're valuable, and what you're on earth to do. That's your identity. The rich man's identity is his money because all the picture that Jesus paints is of a man for whom all that matters to him is his money. All he cares about is the great meal he's going to have that evening and which fine wine he's going to choose to match it with and the designer clothing he's going to wear while eating it. He's nothing but a rich man. His money is his identity. And every time he walks by this poor man that's been laid at his gate, he's blinded by his wealth such that he can't see this poor man. There is someone literally lying on the ground, covered in sores, malnourished. You can see his sunken cheekbones because he hasn't had enough to eat for years. Dogs are licking him. And the rich man is so blinded by his wealth, his identity, he just walks on by when he goes to town. And every time the rich man walks by the poor man, he's taking another step down the road to hell. He is not on that road simply because he has money, nor is he on that road because he's an atheist. In that day and time, that location, no one was an atheist. I'm sure that if you ask the rich man, do you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, he would have said, absolutely, I believe in that God. He would have thought he was a good person. He would say, I'm not using my wealth to oppress anybody. I just like to enjoy the finer things in life. But the rich man is on the road to hell because while he said he believed in God, he did not. He was so consumed by his wealth that he never took what he said he believed about God seriously. And again, we can see this by his behavior. You know, Jesus said there are two great commandments that God has given all people. This is Matthew chapter 27, verses 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We're going to come back to that phrase. So love your neighbor as yourself. That's the command, right? That the rich man would say, yes, that's, that's the command that's been given to me as a member of the covenant people of God. 
No one was a closer neighbor to the rich man than this man, this poor man, literally lying at his gate. Yet the rich, at the rich man's front door is this beggar, and the rich man never saw him. So let me ask you, in the room this morning, please listen to me. Are you just a rich man? Are you just someone who is consumed by wealth and all you can think about is what you're going to do with it and how you're going to save it and how you're going to preserve it and how you're going to make more of it? Are you just a spouse? You know, that's, all, that's your identity, you're a spouse. In my previous church, uh, I very quickly met two widows. I met one widow about a year before I met the other widow. And when I, when I met the second widow, the first widow was present. They were friends. And, and she introduced me, the first widow, to the second widow. And, I mean, within 30 seconds of me meeting this woman, she just launches into how much she misses her husband. And she tells me about how her husband was this powerful man in the community, and she would just very proudly go on his arm to all these different functions in the community, and everybody knew who they were, and everyone would turn their heads when they walked into the room, and she just misses him so much, and she, can't, and she just can't get past the fact that she lost her husband. So when she left, the second widow, I turned to the first widow, the one I knew, and I said, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so sorry. When, when did her husband die? You know, I was thinking she was going to say a week ago or something. And the first widow said, Brother J.D., now you don't have to call me Brother J.D., okay? I'm, I'm J.D. here. That was a different church context. <coughs> Brother J.D., it was three years ago, and she can't stop talking about her husband. I miss my husband, but I have tried to move on, but she hasn't. What happened? I think there's a good chance this woman was just a spouse. Her whole life was bound up into this existence she had created for herself with her husband. And when that was gone, she had nothing left. It was her whole identity. Are you just a spouse? Are you just a parent? I mean, every waking moment you're thinking about your kid's school, your kid's activity, your kid's sports, your kid's appearance. And you would say, of course I'm a Christian. You know, if anybody asks you, you'd say, yeah, I believe in God. But has it gotten to the point to where you're so consumed with your kids that all you can think about is their success such that you basically ignore everyone else in your life, every other neighbor you've got? Are you just a parent? Are you just a career? Are you just a body that looks good? Are you just a sports fan? A few weeks ago, someone sent me a screenshot of something posted on one of the online message boards at an SEC school, not Ole Miss. But the message said, you should be donating 10% of your salary pretext to our school's NIL fund. Stop tithing if you need to until we dig our way out of this hole. We are in a crisis. Your church will be fine. If it's not, good, if it's not fine, you can join another. Football is a religion in our state, and it's time to prove it. Are you just a sports fan? Friends, you can say you believe in God, you can, but if you build your identity on anything other than Him to the point to where you're so blinded, you don't see your neighbor. You don't obey God by loving Him and loving your neighbor as yourself. You're on the road to hell. And it is very possible in the context where we live, the deep south, the Bible belt, to be on this road and not know it. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's the road to hell. Now, second, life in hell. And again, there's scare quotes in my mind, well, and in your handout, but scare quotes around life in hell. There are some big misconceptions out there, I think, 
about what Christians believe about hell. And sometimes Christians <laughs> hold these misconceptions. I have found that a lot of people think that hell is God's guilty little pleasure. Like God enjoys creating individualized torture chambers for people in hell. And people in hell are, are begging for mercy and pleading with God to let them out. And he just closes the lid on them and says, no, it's too late for you. And he gets his giggles out of watching them writhe in their pain and agony. That is not what the Bible says about hell at all. The Word of God is very clear. God does not take pleasure in hell. Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked might turn from his way and live. And then 1 Timothy 2, 4, we read, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God grieves every single soul that winds up in hell. Never think that God gets pleasure out of it. Yet even more revealing about life, so-called, in hell, is what the rich man says there. We see this back and forth in the second half of the parable between the rich man and, and Father Abraham, who would have been you know, the premier patriarch for someone in that day and time in, in, in Israel. Verse 23, we read the rich man's in torment, which isn't surprising. He's in hell. And then verse 24, we read that he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that's the beggar, outside of his gate, to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. All right, just, just think about that for a second, all right? Does that seem odd to you that that would be the request the rich man would have? Abraham, can you just bring the temperature down one half degree in hell? I mean, if you were in hell, if I were in hell, I'll just say, I won't talk for you. If I were in hell and I could see someone in heaven, that would not be my request. What would be my request? Get me out of here. <laughs> Don't bring down the thermostat. Just get me out of this place. But the rich man doesn't say it. There's a reason why. Life in hell is terrible. Life in hell is torment. But those in hell don't want out. They don't want to go to heaven. And there's no place else for them to go. They do not want out. Hell is the natural consequence of rejecting God all your life. Romans, very, Romans chapter 1 is very clear about this. If you go on rejecting God all your days, He will finally give you over to your desires. He will give you over to whatever you've been building your identity on so that forever all you will have is this identity you've built for yourself. Therefore, in an exercise of God's judicial wrath, God says to those on the road to hell, okay, you don't want me? You don't want anything to do with me. You don't want to live for me, who, after all, is your creator and sustainer. You don't want me? Fine. I'm going to give you what you want. Hell is the natural consequence of a life of rebellion lived willingly apart from God. And on top of that, hell is an exercise in eternal disintegration. This identity that you've built for yourself in this life, it goes with you into hell, and hell is an experience that goes on forever of this identity that you've built falling apart around you. I mean, after all, we read that he's in fire in hell. What does fire do? It destroys everything that it touches, right? That's fire's job. This rich man's entire existence on earth forever falls apart in the fire of hell. He doesn't want out of hell. He certainly doesn't want to go to heaven. But he can't and doesn't want to repent. He doesn't want to choose God. He remains in his rebellion. And so all that's left for him is an eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
regret, pain, and remorse, yet never able to see the one thing that could save him. That's what the Bible teaches about life in hell. A couple of other things I want to always point out when I talk about hell. First of all, never, ever, ever, ever think that God's wrath is intrinsic to his character. This, here's what I mean by that. Love is intrinsic to God's character. Holiness is intrinsic to God's character. Righteousness is intrinsic to God's character. But God's wrath is the judicial outworking of His holiness displayed against sinners who rebel against Him. It is not intrinsic to who He is. And God's wrath is nothing like our wrath. When I think about a, a wrathful person, I think of someone who can't control his temper, you know, just flies off the handle at a moment's notice. That's not God. It is His judicial action against those who have rebelled against him. That's the first thing I want to point out about hell here at the end of this point. And then the second thing is, there is good evidence in the scriptures that those in hell are so hardened and so continue in their rebellion against God that they keep on sinning. Again, people in hell aren't saying, oh, I'm so sorry, please let me out. I want to repent. Give me another chance. No one in hell says that. They're so enslaved by their identity, their idols, their sins, that they go on sinning. Revelation 22.11 says, Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So the picture here is of those in hell, more sin and more judgment. More sin and more judgment. More sin and more judgment on and on forever. Let the evildoer still do evil. Hell, C.S. Lewis said, is the greatest monument to human freedom. He writes, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, or those to whom God in the end says, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. And no soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Did you hear that? No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. And that gets us to our final point. How can we avoid hell? A common objection I've heard to Christianity is that if hell is so serious and so real, then why doesn't God make the reality of what we're going to face after death more present to us? I mean, why does he just stick it in a book? Why can't he just put it in our face all the time? Why can't he write in the sky, you know, like once a day at 1 o'clock, repent or burn, you know, if he really wants to keep people out of hell? Or why can't he do some miracle that would convince us of hell's reality? You know, what if, like when I'm petting my dog and scratching her ears, she just starts talking to me and says, oh, thank you for scratching my ears, and by the way, you don't want to go to hell. I mean, I would listen to that. Bertrand Russell was one of the most prominent atheist philosophers in the first part of the 20th century. He was kind of like a precursor to Richard Dawkins today. And at one point, someone asked him if he, what he would say if he was standing before God on Judgment Day and God asked him, Bertrand, why didn't you believe in me? And his response was, not enough evidence. God, there was not enough evidence for me to believe in you. Okay? Well, that's what the rich man says here, isn't it? Let's read verses 27 to 30. Then I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus again, the, the poor man, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. That's the law and the prophets we talked about earlier. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. In other words, the rich man is saying, I know my brothers have the law and the prophets. And yes, we, we read them as kids and, and we revere them and we honor them. But get real. No one is going to base their lives on that book. 
We need something more. My brothers need evidence. I know what will work. Just send someone, send someone from the dead to them. And then they'll turn. Then they'll believe. The rich man, in other words, wants Abraham to pull a Christmas carol on his brothers. You know that story, that Charles Dickens novella? Ebenezer Scrooge, greedy, miserable old man, miserly old man counting his money. And he gets visited by three ghosts one Christmas. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and most terrifyingly of all, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And that ghost shows him his grave, shows him that he's dying, and Scrooge says, I repent! I'll be a better person from now on, I promise, ghost. Just don't, don't let me go to the grave like this. That's what the rich man says his brothers need. They need a Christmas carol treatment. You've heard of scaring the hell out of people? The rich man wants Abraham to scare his brothers out of hell. But what does Abraham say? If your brothers do not hear Moses and the prophets, this is verse 31. If your brothers do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Friends, I promise you if seeing a ghost would keep you out of hell, you'd see him all the time. Our problem isn't a lack of evidence. It wasn't the problem of the Pharisees. Remember, remember chapter 16, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. He's talking to them. He's warning them. And we know that the Pharisees did see someone rise from the dead. John chapter 11, John chapter 12, there was a different man also named Lazarus who was in the tomb four days. But Jesus went to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came stumbling out, coughing and spitting probably, trying to pull the grave clothes off of him. And what, the Pharisees were there, they saw this. How did the Pharisees respond? Did they say, oh my goodness, Jesus is right. We better listen to him. He really is from God. We've got to follow him wherever he leads. Is that what they say? No, they'd already determined to kill Jesus. And so when they saw Lazarus, they said, well, we better kill him too. Because once people see this guy, it's going to be really hard to keep them from following Jesus. Our problem is not a lack of evidence. If you're on the road to hell, more evidence will only cause you to harden your heart even harder. Our problem is not an evidentiary issue. Our problem is a moral issue. Our problem is that we don't care that we don't love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. Our problem is that we don't care how consumed we are by these identities that we built for ourselves on earth. Our problem, if we grew up in church, is that we don't take seriously enough all these warnings the Bible has about life after death and an existence that's very possible in hell. It's not an evidentiary issue. Our problem is a moral problem, and all the ghosts in the world won't change your heart. So what do we do? How do we avoid hell? Well, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, or maybe I didn't, maybe I forgot to say this, but the main character of this parable is the rich man. I mean, he does almost all the talking. Abraham's kind of responding to him, but then there's this third character, right? His name is Lazarus. He never says a word in the parable. And this is the only time in all the parables that Jesus ever told that one of the characters in a parable has a proper name. Now, that, that's no accident. We need to, be, need to pay very close attention to this man's name. Lazarus doesn't speak through his mouth in this parable, but he speaks by his name. Do you know what Lazarus means? It means God has helped. Now, don't you think that's an odd name for Lazarus? I mean, seriously. He's starving to death. He's covered in sores. He's dying just to have scraps fed to him. Dogs are licking him. And some of you might think that's cute, you know, to have your dog licking you. They would not have thought it was cute back then. Dogs were feral animals. They were, they were viewed with disgust 
in the ancient world. How in the world, then, had God helped Lazarus if that's where Lazarus was? Well, remember that Lazarus is not in heaven because he's poor any more than the rich man is in hell because of his money. Lazarus is in heaven because something happened to him in his life. He saw not only the misery of his poverty, which was misery indeed, but he saw the misery of his sin. His eyes were opened not only to the fact that he had this problem of poverty and sickness and isolation. His eyes were opened to the fact that he did not love God as he ought to. And he did not love his neighbor as himself. His biggest problem was that he had broken God's law. And he saw that. God helped him to see that. But he, and then he looked to God and he asked for forgiveness. And now Lazarus is in heaven finally receiving his good things. So friends, here's my question for you. When you look back, just think about your life right now, okay? Think about what you're worried about, what you're excited about, what you're looking forward to, what you're dreading. When you look over your life, what do you see? Are you, are you the kind of person who's just constantly frustrated because you don't think you got a fair deal in life? And you're angry because other people seem to have it so easy and other people got the breaks that you didn't? Are you so consumed with some identity that you've built for yourself that you find you just can't take the trouble to really love anybody? If that's you, God has not yet helped you. And more to the point, you don't want him to. You would rather be angry at God for the raw deal you feel you've gotten in life than have his help. But on the other side, are you the kind of person who is constantly amazed at the life you have? You're amazed at how, God, how good God has been to you because you know you don't deserve it. You're amazed and you say to yourself, I can't believe the mercies God has shown me. I've been so unkind. I have been so greedy. I have been so thoughtless. I have been so selfish. I can't tell you how many times I failed to love my neighbor, but God has shown me so much grace that it shocks me. When you look over your life, can you say something like that? And most of all, does Jesus on the cross make sense to you? I mean, when you see Jesus on the cross, you don't just see something, you know, people wear around their necks or put on, you know, put over their hearth or something like that. What you see on the cross is God saying to you, you deserve to be here, but I loved you so much that I sent my son Jesus Christ to be your substitute. I love you so much that in Jesus Christ, I died. I went to hell in your place so that you won't have to. Do you see? This is the key right here, okay? Do you see Jesus on the cross and say, boy, God has helped. God has helped. If that's you, you're not on the road to hell. Nobody who sees those things has any danger of going to hell. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Can you honestly say, okay, that's my hope right there. No matter how bad things get in this life, I know I'm going there. If that's you, hell has no claims on you. Instead, only the good things God has stored up for you in heaven await. Now let me give you one application before we close. This is for all of us, okay? I was convicted by this myself yesterday. Who is it that, like Lazarus, you're stepping over? 
on your way to town. It's somebody. Who is it that in your hurry to satisfy this identity you've built for yourself, you just find you can't give the time of day to? You know you have been ignoring and not loving this person. And I'm not saying they deserve your love. I'm not saying it's easy to love them. But I'm saying you know you've been walking past them. Students, who is it in your school, on your team, at your play practice, in your neighborhood, who is it that you, fit, that you haven't been paying any attention to because you feel like you're good, too good for them? You feel like they're not worthy of your attention. It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the law and the prophets. See your sins and trust Jesus Christ. Make, make Him your identity. Make the one who died for you, your identity, and say, that's who I am. I want to be like him. He gave himself for me. I want to give myself for others. And if you do that, you'll find that more and more you're seeing the people around you instead of ignoring them. You're loving and caring for them. And you're not just walking past them in your blindness. Think about who is your Lazarus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your